I'm taking you to a place that has fascinated me for an awful long time and it is well off the main road. It's a little village on the banks of the Johor River in Malaysia called Johor Lama or Old Johor. This place was the centre of a wealthy empire that rivalled the Portuguese, the Dutch and the British empires in the region. They traded with the Chinese and with uh, the Persians and Arabs and all manner of Europeans. In fact, over here would have been full of sailing vessels from all around the world. In fact, in the 17th century, they were even sending ambassadors off to Europe. But now, all we have is a small village with the vague outlines of ancient fortifications and lots and lots of graves. So let's explore how it came to this from once being the centre of the Malay universe. It all started with the founder of Singapore. No, 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 not this guy, not Raffles. This guy over here. This is the founder of Singapore, or Singapura, circa 1299. This is San Nila Utama. He came here after a failed rebellion in Pelambang, Sumatra, which was a Buddhist state founded by the Tamil Chola dynasty in the seventh century and they claim to be descended from Alexander the Great. And because he was approved of by the Koran, well, his descendants must also have the right to wield the sword of kingship. In those days, Singapore was called Temasek. But when Sang Nila Utama arrived, he said he saw a lion. And so he called it Singapore, Lion City. Oh yeah. There ain't no such thing as a line in these ear parts. There is some debate about uh, all this line business being more a symbol of a change of dynasty. Uh, you know, lines are cool and vaguely associated with early Buddhist uh, iconography. But much of uh, pre-colonial history is hidden in this sort of myth and mystery and one of the problems is that in the 16th century when Islam arrived here uh, they they rewrote the books and uh, changed names and changed dates uh, and caused much confusion for example take a look at this over here this might be the tomb of the founder of Singapore and they call him Sultan Iskandar Shah. This just happens to be the name of the man who founded Malacca in 1400. And both he and Sang Nila Utama went by the name of uh, Paramiswara, uh, which in Sanskrit means big chief or supreme lord. And they both ruled Singapore. Which could be the reason for all the confusion. Whoever's tomb it is, it's unlikely to have been Iskandar Shah's. In the 17th century, the half boogie Portuguese writer Manuel Godino de Heredia said that uh, Iskandar Shah's tomb was north of Malacca at this place in Tangentuan. Well, 
Well, we've looked all over Tendon to and for the tomb of Iskander Shah, and we can't find it. It must be somewhere around here. Uh, we're told there's a little pathway that uh, leads off to a, a secret place where he's supposed to be. Well, it's obviously far too secret for us to find. And um, even if we did find it, we have been told, uh, there's not much there anyway. Which does beg the question as to why this little piece of local history is so neglected. Maybe the reason for the neglect of this story is that you just can't tell the children everything. Paramisra's story is that uh, he stripped a deceitful concubine naked in public, thus shaming her and her family, thus provoking her father to help the rival Majapahit Empire of Java to come to Singapore and get rid of that damned man. According to the Malay Annals, written in the 16th century, Iskander Shah, also known as Paramiswara, had to run for his life as 200,000 Majapahit warriors attacked Singapore, making the rivers run red with blood. You'd imagine this would blunt anyone's appetite for kingship, but this man was not a man ready for early retirement. One theme in this history that comes through loud and clear is that if you believe you are a king, then you need a kingdom. And if there isn't one, well, you just go out and make one. At first, Paramiswara turned up at this place in Moi, and he called it Biawak Usuk. And no, that's not Malay for bus station. In fact, Biawak Busa means stinky lizard. And you can still see them down here if you look closely. Tommy Perez, a Portuguese historian in 1515, said that Paramisra thought this such a stinky lizard sort of place that he immediately moved to Kota Baruch. Somewhere down here, Paramisra camped out. It was supposed to have camped out here for a number of years. It was a very remote area, and uh, one can quite understand why he decided, let's move to Malacca. There's much more fun to be had up there. story is that Paramiswara visited the area and saw a mouse deer being outwitted by a dog. He took this as a great omen and decided that he should move up here and named the place Malacca after the tree that he was standing next to. The question is which came first, the tree or the city? Siamese sources say they were extracting tribute from a trading port here 500 years earlier. And the name Malacca bears some resemblance to the Arabic word Merlakat, which basically means a gathering place for traders. So perhaps the founding of Malacca was less poetic 
and more a case of Paramisra seeing an opportunity for new management. And around about this time, the Chinese were sending envoys to all the ports around Southeast Asia. The reports getting back to the Imperial Palace about Malacca must have been pretty impressive because then they sent Admiral Sheng He and his fleet. We're not quite sure whether it was exactly this point, but it was somewhere around about here that they first turned up. History is both about and is the battle for people's souls, which is why facts and the analysis of those facts are so contentious. Which makes me ask, um, how did this Buddhist prince Paramiswara become the Islamic Sultan Iskandar Shah? Just like today, a state needs to be recognised as such by other states. And in the 15th century, there were none more powerful than China. And Paramisra found a sponsor in the form of the Chinese Admiral Cheng He, who was from the west of China and a Muslim. Is it possible that China brought Islam to Malacca? Cheng He certainly must have given the impression that the two forces of China and Islam were the future. And in 1411, Paramisvara visited the Chinese emperor in Peking and returned with an imperial seal, a complete set of imperial standard clothing, a yellow regal umbrella and a pot of money, in short a medieval startup fund. And thus began the symbiotic relationship between the Chinese and the Malay sultans. <laughs> So why don't the Malays consider themselves a variant of the Chinese? Why are they all Peranakin? The Peranakin are Chinese who married Malays. They have their own cuisine and they mix Chinese and Malay cultural activities. The Sultans all married Chinese and yet they didn't become Peranakin. Paramiswara married a high-ranking Muslim girl and acquired the name Iskandar Shah, which must have helped secure his standing amongst the Muslim traders from the Gulf and India. I bet Paramisvara was a little bit Muslim, a little bit Hindu, and probably still a little bit Buddhist, and maybe even Taoist. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. That's the rule in a port city. It's good business to cover all the angles. And just to make sure of his security, especially now that the Siamese have begun to ask for tribute again, he let Zheng He and his fleet set up their headquarters up there on Bukit China. This is Li Po's temple. It was built for Li Po, and she was the wife of the sixth Sultan Mansur Shah. And better than that, she was also the daughter of the Chinese emperor. And she brought with her a 500 strong retinue. And that's an awful lot of Chinese living in this area.
This is a well dug by Cheng He's forces. In fact, they dug a number of wells down the bottom of uh, Bukit China. These walls here are largely the result of the Portuguese and the Dutch, but they cover much the same sort of ground as those built by the second Malaccan ruler, Megat Iskander Shah. It's not entirely clear whether Megat was a Muslim or not. He did marry a Tamil wife. However, he was still within the Chinese sphere of influence and visited the Chinese emperor twice. And he never called himself a Sultan. Here, north of Malacca at Pengalan campus, we find the first Islamic tomb in Malaysia. This is the tomb of Sheikh Ahmed Maktoum. Now, nobody knows where he came from. Uh, they think he could have been Indian or he could have come from Minangabau, which is in Sumatra. Uh, this is Negeri Sembilan area and there's a lot of Minangabau here. Uh, but he, he came here in the 15th century to preach Islam and to trade perhaps mostly to trade, but he was certainly an important figure in this particular area. He got into conflict, apparently, with uh, Sultan Mansur Shah, but Sultan Mansur Shah was uh, presiding over Malacca during its heyday. He was expanding everywhere, and, and at that period, a number of Islamic scholars came here to struggle for the soul of the nation. And this is dedicated to Ahmed Maktoum's struggle and victory. It was a prosperous period, attracting a lot of people, especially Syed Abdul Aziz, a Sunni ulama and his religious teacher. And it was under his influence that in around 1425, Megat's son, considered to be the third Sultan of Malacca, took the name of Mohammed Shah. And under the advice of Syed Abdulaziz, the administration started to call itself a Sultanate, with all the associated legal codes and trappings. However, Mohammed Shah's son, Raja Ibrahim, refused to convert, and no doubt just to screw around his dad, he changed his Muslim name back to Sri Paramisra Jua Shah. And so the fourth ruler of Malacca was stabbed to death under the orders of the Tamil Muslim Bendahara in favor of his elder brother from another mother. And he took the Islamic title of Sultan Musafa Shah. And his claim to fame was a famous defeat of the Buddhist Siamese at Batu Pahat, south of Moa, which meant God was on their side Buddhism was passé, and thus Malay royalty gained their legitimacy from the Quran and not from the Chinese emperor. Meet my best friend, the respected Laksamana Hang Chua. He must be my best friend because he'd never let anybody else touch his Chris. Every Malay knows the legend of Hang Tua. This is Hang Tua's well, dug by Hang Tua and his pals, Hang Lekir, Hang Leklu, Hang Kasturi, Hang Jerbat, all rumoured to have been Chinese. They were born in this area, which isn't that far away from Zheng He's camp, just over there. And they were practitioners of Silat, which is a bit on the Kung Fu side, if you ask me. No, he wasn't noted for being long and thin. He was noted for being very loyal to the Sultan, no matter how awful the man was. He coined this phrase, Tak Melayu Hilang di Dunia, 
Never shall the Malays vanish from the earth. So how could he have been Chinese? A Malay is a Muslim, loyal to his Sultan, and up for a fight, especially if you mess with his women. This huge museum complex is dedicated to one story only, the legend of Hang Tua. Which should tell you that there are certain values that this story has that the Malaysian state wants to emphasize. The Sultan Mansur Shah wrongly accused Hang Tua of uh, having an affair with one of his harem. Hang Tua's best friend, Hang Jebet, quoted as saying, a kind king is a king to obey and a cruel king is a king to fight against, raised a rebellion in defense of Hang Tua. In a crafty sultanish move, Sultan Mansur Shah pardoned Hang Tua, but only if he killed his rebellious friend. Naturally, Hang Tua had to show his absolute loyalty. The Sultan is God's representative on Earth, so it's God's will. <laughs> Basically, if you want to start a fist fight in Malaysia, start saying Hang Tua's Chinese. It is often the case that as the wealth and power of a state increases, crime and corruption escalate. In short, the rot sets in. And so Sultan Alawadin Shah VII used to go out into the streets incognito to protect his people. Obviously, delegation was not one of his strong points. One of the stories has him going out into the streets and discovering a bunch of guys robbing a shop. He kills two of them with his own hands. Now, as you can imagine, the people thought he was really cool, but he was always reprimanding his ministers for failing to do their duty. So they had a very different opinion of him. Which is why the Sultan liked to stay up here at his palace in Pago. And while he was up here, out of the way in the hills, back in Malacca, his Bandahara Tung Mahatir plotted. And so we find, after a reign of 11 years, at around about the age of 30, the seventh Sultan of Malacca, Sultan Alawadin Riyat Shah, met a typically royal fate. His Indian wife poisoned him. I don't know, we in trouble, huh? A very young 8th Sultan Mahmud Shah then came to power, with of course powerful Indian advisers, and so began the sequence of events that eventually drove them to Johor Lama. This ship is Malacca's Maritime Museum. It's a mock-up of a Portuguese galleon. Now many people think that the Portuguese blasted their way in here using their superior technology. But in fact, technologically and intellectually, the Malays and the Portuguese were pretty much on the same level. The weakness of the Sultans was political. Mahmud Shah's officials increased taxes, indulged in kickbacks, and discriminated against the Chinese and the Hindus. And whilst they were fiddling the books, Mahmud Shah sent the aging Hang Chua out to find him women that he rather fancied. Which is always the sign that there's trouble on the way. One noted beauty told Hang Tua that first he had to bring her seven trays of mosquito hearts. You could tell she wasn't keen. 
Then in 1509, Sultan Mahmud was uh, approached by a delegation of Chinese traders asking him to give some recently arrived Portuguese a license to set up shop in Malacca. The Chinese had been doing good business with the Portuguese in Cochin, India. At first, Mahmud Shah agreed to trade with the Portuguese, but his Gujarati advisers told him that back in India, the infidel Portuguese were at war with the Muslims, so trade had to give way to jihad. There's an interesting sign here. It says, the museum serves as a reminder that once the political power is lost, everything else is lost. Well, Sultan Mahmud Shah should have taken note for once his decision to trade with the Portuguese had been overturned by his advisers, well, his fate was sealed. So while the Chinese were having a celebratory dinner with 20 of the Portuguese, the Sultan's Orang Laut attacked the Portuguese ships. After a fierce fight, they were repelled and the ships fled leaving behind their compatriots at the dinner table and a note stuffed into the severed head of one of the orang lout saying roughly, we'll be back. Over a year later, in 1511, Viceroy Afonso de Albuquerque turned up with his fleet and demanded the return of the 20 Portuguese prisoners. The Sultan learned that Albuquerque only had a thousand men, and so from behind his city walls, with all his cannon and his fearless navy and 20,000 well-armed soldiers, he told Albuquerque to go to hell. What he didn't bargain for was the Portuguese just parking offshore and letting loose a barrage of cannonballs for weeks on end. This makes a man very nervous. And so the Sultan released the prisoners. But now Alfonso Albuquerque wanted compensation. The Sultan refused, not realising that Albuquerque had been petitioned by various Malaccans to get rid of the Sultans. And then the local Chinese supplied Albuquerque with barges to land his men. As the ships lay down a barrage, the Portuguese came through the main gates, running right into the Sultan and his sons, counter-attacking on war elephants. The Portuguese scattered, but as victory loomed for Sultan Mahmud Shah, Ahmed, his eldest son, fell off his elephant. Then the royal elephants panicked and scattered the Malay troops. And in the confusion, some of the Portuguese managed to run all the way to the palace where they set it alight. The Sultan and his family, injured and confused, leapt on the first boat out of there. Sultan's boats stopped here at Parit Karang Laut, just north of Moa. In those days it was an important little port and he was sick and his legendary beauty of a wife Tunteja was also sick. In fact she was probably sick of him. The story of Tunteja is that she was lured to the Sultan's harem by a love potion that was applied to her chair by the elderly Han Tua. And then, in a fit of passion, or perhaps just stunned, she was kidnapped by Han Tua, who then fought a sea battle with her father before handing her over to the Sultan. The Sultan and his entourage fled, leaving behind Tunteja, defended by a few of her warriors. There was a bit of a fight with the Portuguese in where they were killed. And uh, it's thought, well, local historians think, that uh, Tunteja is buried in this graveyard over here, as opposed to in her official keramat over in Malacca. With the Sultan injured and his trophy wife dead, 
His advisors were wondering what the hell had gone wrong. The Sultan and his retinue were in an extremely bad way. But then things were about to get even worse. This is the Sungai Pago, in other words, the Pago River. This place is where the Sultan's sons put up their last stand against the Portuguese in fortifications that controlled where the Pago River and the Moa River converged. In those days, the rivers were highways. And this particular river allowed trade to move for all the way from the west coast of the peninsula to the east coast. And so it was essential to the control of all of Johor. The Sultan's sons and remaining forces camped here waiting for the Portuguese to finish looting Malacca and leave. Instead, the Portuguese and 2,000 deserters from the Sultan's army attacked and once again there was a chaotic scrambling that scattered the Sultan and his sons to the wind. And it is here, right here, at this spot where the colonial era began. of gold. And for the next six years he was a hunted and halted man and despite his sword of kinship, broke. And so under pressure from his son Ahmed, he handed Ahmed his sword of kingship and then decided that Ahmed was incompetent and killed him, as a good father should. And despite numerous attempts to get Malacca back from the Portuguese, Sultan Mahmud Shah was forced to hide away in Sumatra where he died a bitterly disappointed man. His two sons then went their own way, and Musafir Shah, the eldest, declared himself the heir to the Malaccan Sultanate and waved none other than the very sword that Sangnila Utama was supposed to have owned. And the people of Perak decided to take him at his word and say, yeah, OK, you can be Sultan here. Meanwhile, his younger brother, Aluaddin, came up the Johor River and declared himself Sultan of Johor, as one would. It's hard to know what Aluaddin's ambitions were uh, because it was his brother who claimed to be the rightful heir to Malacca. So perhaps he was relying a little less upon the sword of kingship and a bit more on the old fashioned pirate sword. So he set up shop right here in Kota Kara and it was from here that he would direct his loyal Orang Laut to divert Malacca's trade up to his river. And pretty soon his finances were increasing and Malacca's were declining. And so you would imagine that the Portuguese would have uh, reduced their prices and increased their efficiency and perhaps opened up a nice Instagram account to improve their marketing. Uh, but in 1535, that's not exactly what business was all about. So to destroy the competition, the Portuguese burnt Cota Cara to the ground leaving no trace.
Sultan Alawadin Riyadh Shah II, ever the optimist, he moved his operation here at Kota Sayong and he built a nice fortress and for the next five years he did very well, largely because he made a truce with the Portuguese not to harass their trade but instead to harass the shipping of the Archanese. Sultan Ali Mukhayat Shah of Arche had declared a jihad against the infidel Portuguese, which he interpreted as taking control of what had once been the Malacca Sultanate's lands in Sumatra. Hold on, said Alawadin and his brother, those are ours. You're worse than the damn Portuguese, you treacherous backstabbing son of a dog. Or words to that effect. So in 1540 at Sunai Pana in Sumatra, the brothers caught the archer fleet of canoes, galleys and barges and slaughtered 13,500 of them. Well, that gave Arche pause for thought. And as you could imagine, you'd think that Alawadin uh, would have taken a, a bit of a rest after that, but no. Alawadin went on to build Kota Batu, the stone fortress, or Johor Lama as we now know it. And this is something that the Portuguese took as a bit of a challenge and in 1555 they decided that they would come and destroy it. The town was mauled by the Portuguese raid but managed to survive and Alawadin, ever the pragmatist, then entered into a long and lucrative traded agreement with the Portuguese by essentially accepting all their terms, which did not sit well with the Archanese. In 1564, the Archanese sacked Johor Lama. Not only were hundreds of cannon and lots of loot taken, but also they managed to capture the whole Alawadin family and whisk them off to Arche. By now, Alawadin must have begun to despair. The Sultan of Arche considered himself the only true direct descendant of Alexander the Great and thus the righteous holder of the true sword of kingship. And to make his point, the Sultan of Arche married one of his daughters from a lesser wife to the eldest son of Alawadin, Musafa, and sent him off to Johor to work as his vassal and kept Alawadin back in Arche as his hostage. Some say he was tortured and murdered. Another say he returned here to Johor Lama where he died. Maybe this is him over here. This might be him or it might not be him. There's supposed to be a grave in Singapore that's supposed to be his. I'm afraid the, uh, the sultans were remarkably careless where they died. Whatever happened to him though, his power was thoroughly broken and Johor came under the thumb of Arche. According to the Malay annals, Sultan Alawadin's son, Musafir Shah, moved the capital to this place here, Bukit Seluyut. And uh, Bukit Seluyut just happens to be the birthplace of Tun Sri Lanang, the writer of the Malay Annals. And in fact, we have here Tun Hisat Misai, the grandfather of Tun Sri Lanang. Right on the top of this hill, somewhere up there, there's a stone fortress. That's uh, supposed to be Mustafa Shah's palace. And in fact, we have Mustafa Shah here, along with his sister and uh, little Sultan Abdul Jalil. And uh, he became Sultan at the age of nine years old and uh, died under very mysterious circumstances at the age of 10. More of that later on.
but under Arche, Johor Lama was bigger and better than ever. So much so that in 1576 it repulsed a Portuguese attack. And then in 1578, a Portuguese fleet followed an Arjanese fleet up the river and once again attacked Johor Lama run away. Once again, the Portuguese had little success. Fortress Johor was proven its worth. There were ramparts to the left of me, ramparts to the right of me, the gunning placements all along the front. Johor Lama seemed solid. But there must have been a bit of jiggery pokery at court because Sultan Mustafa Shah dies, probably poisoned, and is succeeded by his nine year old nephew. And the new Sultan also mysteriously dies, probably poisoned. And this time his father takes over and becomes Sultan Ali Jalla Shah. And he is surprisingly friendly towards the Portuguese. <coughs> Does one smell the hand of a foreign power interfering in the elections of another? Consequently, Sultan Ali Jalashah in 1582 kicks the Archinese out. The Archinese don't take too kindly to that and so they return to burn Johor Lama to the ground only to be repulsed by the Portuguese. By now, the Orang Lao must have been terribly confused as to whose side they were on and who was their rightful ruler. So despite being allies with the Portuguese, the Orang Lao never gave up attacking Portuguese ships and despite the Portuguese being allies with Johor, the Portuguese never quite gave up the pursuit of Johor shipping either. So after one incident too many, the Portuguese started burning villages and the Sultan started sinking more Portuguese ships and so the Portuguese burnt more villages and the Sultan sank more Portuguese ships and so on. And in 1586, Malacca comes under siege by Sultan Ali Jalla Shah and his allies. As Malacca starves, the Portuguese decide that Ali must go. By July 1587, the Portuguese had a fleet come up the river here. And because they only had 300 armed men on board, they didn't have enough men to make a direct assault. So for the next month, they engaged in an artillery duel with the suburbs of Johor Lama. The Sultan could do nothing but watch all the wooden buildings slowly turn into matchwood. On the 15th of August, 1587, reinforcements arrived from Goa. They now had 600 heavily armed men. And according to this map here, they launched their assault by running up this beach and ran to the gates. Trust me, these guys in full armour must have been enormously fit because frankly the heat is getting right to me. And once the Portuguese had broken through the gates, the Malays retreated down the street to various barricades that they had set up. Now I'm assuming that after the bombardment the whole place would have been littered with lumps of wood and trees and stuff. The gates would have been here going to this map. And, oh, quite frankly, the Portuguese, in all their heavy armour, could make no more advance, and I'm not surprised. As the invading force was busy on the other side of Johor Lama, 
a small group of Portuguese had managed to come to the other side here and climb into this redoubt, which was a gun emplacement defending the river. They arrived here and there was absolutely nobody here at all. And so, exhausted, they simply sat down and had a sleep. They had absolutely no idea what was going on anywhere. But then a messenger got through to them saying, essentially, in Portuguese, in no uncertain terms, where the hell are you? At which point they woke up and they looked around and they noticed that not only were Malays uh, no longer in this part of the, the town, but they'd left behind their, their guns fully loaded. And so, they run over to this part here, decided to uh, announce that uh, they were here by firing off a volley over the, t over the town. And it caused great confusion. A rumor suddenly spread that uh, the Sultan had departed. And of course, uh, once the Sultan's made a run for it, whether true or not, we don't know, but uh, as soon as the Sultan is supposed to have gone, all the Malays just ran off. And miraculously, the Portuguese found themselves in possession of Johor Lama. Sultan Ali ran up the river to Batu Sawa, which is near modern-day Kota Tinggi. But he was beaten. And in 1597, he died. And his son, Sultan Aluadin Riyat Shah III, which is very confusing, all these Riyat Shahs and Sultan Aluadins, etc. Anyway, to simplify matters, he became known as the Royal Drunk. Cheers. And one can sympathize because um, for the past 80 years, every time his family had set up business, the Portuguese had burst in and taken everything away from them. Now, the royal drunk might well have given up, but his brother, Raja Bongsu, he had another plan. He decided to go Dutch. Rajar Bongsu seems to have been a very useful man to know. Dutch commentators of the time mentioned how handsome he was, how smart he was, and how he rightly should have been king. They liked him. He sailed with them, he helped them trade and kicked the Portuguese out of the Moluccas Islands. This was all very well, but our drunken sultan wasn't quite so impressed by the abstemious and austere Dutch. Perhaps he just looked at the sun and the sea and the sand and thought, let's open up some coconut wine and chill. Then he signed a treaty with the Portuguese. Raja Bongsu was infuriated. And worse still, so were the Archanese. And in 1613, they did what they always did. They grabbed the Sultan and they dragged him off to Arche. And the story goes is that they made him eat a plate of shit. And then some people say that they murdered him or they chased him away to the island of Linga. Either way, Raja Bongsu becomes Sultan Abdullah and spends his time in a permanent war with Arche, finally escaping to Great Tamberlin Island, from where he cultivated his holdings in Borneo on the Sambas River until his death in 1623. The Dutch thus declared the kingdom of Johor dead. The son of the drunken Sultan, now Sultan Abdul Jalil, continued his father's disastrous policy of a line with the Portuguese. But then the Portuguese defeat an Archanese force of 19,000 men and the Sultan is 
on the winning side again and back in business big time. Sultan Abdul Jalil Shah. Uh, he was holed up in this place. There's just a few tombs now, but uh, frankly, even in his day, there wasn't much. We've no idea who these people are, but uh, in his day, this place was a very important place, so perhaps they were very important people. The river here was a, a murky, fly-blown sort of place, fit for nobody but a few lizards. And everybody here was plagued by illness and I'm not surprised by the amount of mosquito bites I've just got. Which leads me to think that uh, perhaps it was less a centre of administration and much more of a hideout. Sultan. Abdul Jalil was given a chance to get Malacca back, so he switched sides and joined the Dutch in a siege of the place. Thousands of Malaccans were killed or fled, and 3,000 of them rushed and hid away in the Afamosa fortress. The Portuguese had had enough, and with the offer of 80,000 pieces of eight and a free passage home, the governor decided to turn a blind eye and allow the East Gate to be opened up and in rushed a combined Dutch and Malay force that ransacked the place and thus ended the long and painful reign of the Portuguese. <laughs> The truth about Malacca is that, although it became a European trading centre, ever since the Portuguese took over, its business had been going downhill. And now it deteriorated even further because the Dutch were in no hurry to create a rival to their new settlement in Batavia. Sultan Abdul Jalil was probably thinking what he could do with the place if given half the chance. But no, the Dutch weren't even going to let him have the slightest share of their profits. So Sultan Jalil opened up the Riau Islands to all ships and all commerce. And once again, one sees Johor growing. Sultan Jalil extended his territories to include the River Klang, Lingi, Moa, Patu Pahat, Singapore, Pulau Tinggi, the Keraman Islands, the islands of Bintan, Bulan, Bengkalis, and in Sumatra, the rivers Siak and Kampar. And Sultan Jalil was the comeback kid. He moved back to Batu Sour and for the next 20 years business was good. They traded in tin, spice, gold, slaves. Everybody was welcome. Uh, you had the Dutch, you had the Portuguese, the, uh, you had the Japanese and the Chinese and, and even the English at that time. And soon Johor became the most powerful state in the region.
And then in 1663, in a dispute over a jilted princess from Jambi in Sumatra, they entered into a, a seven-year war of tit-for-tat raids that uh, resulted in the Jambi sending 75 warships up the river to Batu Sawa and burning it down. After which they carried off 100,000 Dutch guilders and over 100 cannon and 2,500 Malay soldiers. In retaliation, Sultan Jalil oh. went to Jambi Laksana uh. and cut off his hands and feet and opened up his backbone and rubbed salt into it. And over the next seven years, things go very quiet as Johor tries to get things put back together again. Then in 1677, Sultan Jalil dies. In his 90s, which is quite a feat considering the period, even more of a feat was that, uh, given the sexual opportunities of the Sultans, he dies childless. And it is a truth universally known that a kingdom with a solid economy is in need of a king. Without an obvious heir, things got really weird. A mysterious cousin took over as Sultan, uh, and the Dutch thought he might have been a uh, turbulent imam that had been kicked out of Sumatra, which probably means they thought it was a bit of a nut job. And that might explain why his three wives in 1685 poisoned him. His son, became Sultan Mahmud. Not an auspicious name. The British captain Alexander Hamilton wrote in his accounts of his trading voyages how he presented Sultan Mahmud with a pair of pistols. The Sultan, described as a youth of 20 ah. years, viciously inclined, <laughs> tested them out by shooting some poor fellow on the street through the shoulder. Worse still, the captain said that the Sultan was a great sodomite who had forced many of his noble sons into service for this purpose. I guess he thought that women were just too much trouble. Sultan Mahmud buried here in a little more splendour than uh, many of the others. There are a number of stories uh, about how he met his end and the one that's captured the imagination of the Malays has been the story about the pregnant wife of Laksamana Bentan who uh, took a fancy to eat a uh, jackfruit from a tray that was destined for the Sultan. Needless to say, he was most annoyed. And when he asked her why she did it, she said, oh, well, I, I, I did it for the baby. And uh, to see if she was lying or not, he just ripped open her stomach, took a look at the baby and, well, of course, she, she supposedly found a piece of jackfruit in the baby's mouth. Well, as you can imagine, Laksamana Bentan was not too pleased. In fact, he took his revenge by christening the Sultan whilst he was on the way to this mosque here. The Sultan, fatally wounded, still managed to leap out of his sedan chair and stab the Laksamana to death. It has to be said that these guys were always up for a scrap. Mind you, I think the uh, Sultan was probably a victim of some bad press. He had a more sentimental side, at least. Because here, he buried his pet cat. <laughs> with all due ceremony. And uh, the pet cat was noted for having two horns upon its head. And if you recall, uh, they all thought that they descended from Alexander the Great, the two-horned one. So here we have 
Iskander the cat. Lexamana Bintan and his unfortunate wife are buried up here. I wonder if his fleet sailed by saluting him or cursing him for ending the reign of the Malaccan sultans. Anyway, they sailed away and in 1700, the Bendahara took over as Sultan. He'd been running the place anyway. So uh, he became Sultan Abdul Jalal Riyat Shah the Fourth. I refer again to Captain Alexander Hamilton, who said that Sultan Abdul was a prince of great moderation and justice. Well, he must have been, because he offered Alexander Hamilton the island of Singapore to do with as he pleased. The captain turned him down though, which probably puts him on a par with a record company that turned down the Beatles. Whatever the Sultan's merits, having lost the support of the Orang Laut, in stepped a character called Raja Kachil, the Little Raja. He had been brought up in the Menangabao court in Sumatra, and despite Sultan Mahmud Shah's lack of interest in women, Raja Kachil claimed to be his true son and heir. Which brings me back to Johor Lama. Sultan Abdul Jalil decided that he'd rather spend his time with religion rather than commerce. He left all that nasty sort of stuff to his brother Raja Muda. And Raja Muda set up shop here in Johor Lama. And one day he was playing a nice game of chess in front of the waterfront and a raiding party from Meninga Bao turned up, bribed their way past all the guards and the cannons, and suddenly he's had to gather up all his family and run for the forests. And the story is that he took his Chris, killed all his wives, killed all his children, and then slit his own throat. Well, a likely story. Perhaps the Minanga Bao had something to do with it. But whatever it was, it meant that business diverted itself to the Riau Islands. This was all part of the 20 year conflict between the Bendahara Sultanate and Raja Kachil. And Raja Kachil was a bit of a messianic character. As a baby, he'd been rescued from Mad Sultan Mahmud's family and uh, brought up with a deep sense of his own destiny. Based in Siak in Sumatra, he declared restoration of the old traditions, the old Daulut, and uh, managed to um, rally various Sumatran communities like the Minangabao and the Rang Laut. And he even managed to uh, get the Bugis from Sulawesi to join in with him. And they embarked upon a series of raids and misadventures and misalliances that uh, finally ended in 1720 with the cutting of Sultan Abdul Jalil's throat whilst he was at prayer. A young son of uh, Abdul Jalil's was captured and he was turned into a page by Raja Kajil and given the job of being his beetle box carrier. Now looking after the Sultan's nuts was considered to be a great honour. And the Bugis from the island of Sulawesi saw this as a magnificent business opportunity. Joho River was now a sleepy little backwater. All economic activity had moved off to the Riau Islands, and so Raja Kachil decided to set up base there. And five Bugis chieftains rubbed their hands together and said, Perfect. And remember that beetle box carrier? Well, the Bugis attacked Riau, captured him, and declared him Sultan Suleiman Badrul Alam Shah. 
The Boogie's princes went on their massive stripping and women grabbing binge throughout the Malay Peninsula. In 1746, Raja Kachil literally went mad and died sleeping beside the grave of his favourite wife while his sons fell into a long squabble over who was to rule Siak. Sultan Solomon, now all grown up, told the Dutch that they could have Siak with his blessing, so long as they protected him against his so-called allies, the Bugis. And then he thought that he could restore Johor's fortunes by the magic of a proper coronation. So he ordered Dame Cambodia, who was now his Yam Chuan Muda, to hand over the royal regalia. Needless to say, Dame Cambodia refused to hand over the royal regalia. And Sultan Solomon, now desperate, offered to cede the Linga Islands to the Dutch if they rid him of those damned boogies. Fed up with these overtures to the Dutch, Dane Cambodia made his feelings very plain indeed. He sailed right up to the palace and stormed in and put the fear of God into the Malay faction. And in 1760, Sultan Solomon died, leaving his sons to sort out the relationship with the Bugis. Not that his sons had much time to uh, deal with the Bugis. Um, his son Sultan Mwazim Abdul Shah, a few months after being made Sultan, managed to get himself poisoned. In Cambodia, he declared himself the uh, protector and guardian of the next Sultan, Sultan Abdul Riyad Shah, a mere boy. Well, the, the kitchens uh, of the palace were obviously not up to scratch because he managed to get himself poisoned as well. In Cambodia, and Raja Haji then declared war on the Dutch and they terrified them into sharing Malacca's profits. The Bugis were unstoppable. But then in 1782, Raja Haji took over from Dame Cambodia and claimed that the Dutch were not living up to their promises. So he allied with the Sultan of Selangor in order to finish the Dutch off once and for all. The Bugis lay siege to Malacca and they took control of all the suburbs. And uh, Raja Haj and his men, they took a fortified position over there in a place called Tanjan Palace. But of course the inevitable happened. Reinforcements arrived from Batavia while Raja Haj was entertaining his men with dance competitions, as a good Sufi should. The Dutch surprised him, and Raja Haji, heroic resistance fighter, Sufi saint or bloodthirsty pirate, take your pick, is killed while desperately fighting with a dagger in one hand and an Islamic treatise, the guide to grace, in the other. Boogie's power was completely destroyed. The Dutch even chased them out of the Riau Islands. The Dutch now reign supreme. But in 1795, it all changed again. Our soap opera continues. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British took over the Dutch colonies, placing William Farquhar in charge of Malacca and Tom Raffles in charge of Batavia. Meanwhile, Sultan Mahmud died leaving as usual, two squabbling sons, the portly spendthrift Hussein and the religiously inclined Abdul. The Sultan's wife, Princess Hamida, wanted Hussein, but the wicked Bugis wanted to put Abdul on the throne. And so Princess Hamida hid the royal regalia in the island of Penyangat, and a seven-year stalemate ensued where no one was allowed to wield the sword of kingship. Riau's Temenggong Abdul Rahman, confusingly having the same name as the new Sultan, well, significantly he kept on using the old Sultan's seals. So he diplomatically left Riau for Singapore in order to set up Gambia plantations with a Chinese brotherhood descended from anti-Qing rebels. 
As part of the post-Napoleonic settlement, the British returned Malacca and Batavia to the Dutch. And the Dutch promptly closed all their ports to British shipping. So Farquhar was sent out to find alternative ports for the British to trade in. And the Temengong Abdul Rahman made him an offer he could not refuse. Raffles, whose magnificent statue you can see over here in front of this, uh, what's this, the Victoria Memorial Hall? Well, he was relegated to Governor of Ben Coolin. This was a failed British colony in the backside of Sumatra. And he described it as the most dismal place on earth. So naturally, he leapt at the opportunity that Farquhar brought to him. And in 1819, Hussein agreed to let the English have a trading post in Singapore in exchange for $5,000 a year, plus recognition of him as the Sultan of Johor. And the Dutch were furious. The Dutch rushed to Johor Lama to raise Sultan Abdul Rahman's flag. But the village head said that he would not fly the Sultan's flag until the Sultan had been installed with the full royal regalia. Abdul Rahman, who dressed like an Arab and not a Malay, uh, acted as a muezzin at his local mosque. And as far as he was concerned, his brother was welcome to the crown. He had much better things to do. The Dutch sent troops to Pulau Penyangat and they seized the royal regalia from Princess Hamida and then they seized Abdul Rahman and installed him on the throne, much against his better judgment. And then they quickly ran back to Johor Lama and raised their flag and claimed all of Johor as part of his sultanate. In 1824 though, after a bit of sleight of hand with hidden compensatory packages, the Treaty of London was signed in which the Dutch happily ceded Malacca to the British in exchange for the dismal Ben Kulin and anything south of Singapore, including the now highly lucrative Riau Islands, thus creating two sultanates, Johor and Riau Linga. And the British rushed back, tore down everybody else's flags, put up theirs, But strictly speaking, it wasn't their territory. But whose territory was it? Back in Singapore, in Kampong Glam, where the Sultan lived, the British informed the Temagong and the Sultan that not only were their opium and gambling concessions removed, but also all their authority. The Sultanate was abolished and Singapore was to become a crown colony. And Raffles offered to set them up as traders. But they said that was beneath their dignity. But what wasn't beneath their dignity was armed robbery, at least according to Raffles Secretary Munchi Abdullah. All manner of murders were ascribed to the entourage of the Temengong and the Sultan. So much so that Governor Crawford banned the wearing of Chris. And the Sultan was furious. I mean, what's a Malay without his Chris? Nothing. And for the next 10 years, Sultan Hussein lived an increasingly frustrated, unhappy and insolvent life in Singapore over here in the palace. First his slave girls threw themselves under the protection of British law so that they could find more lucrative employment in British households. And then Governor Crawford built a road right through the centre of the Sultan's private land. And then the Sultan's Indian accountant stopped payment to the Sultan's rather large and grasping family. And even they began to threaten his life. And so Sultan Hussein 
downsizing, bought himself a modest little house along this street in Malacca. I do get a sense that poor old Sultan Hussein is much maligned though. He seemed to confirm the early 19th century British prejudices against the Orientals. They described him as pot-bellied, indolent, extravagant and debauched. Or to put it another way, he liked his food, he loved chilling out, he was extravagant to a fault and he loved the ladies. I bet he was a lot more fun to be with than that dour brother of his. So I'm rather hoping that his house wasn't too modest. I like to think that he still had a taste for the bling and could shock the neighbours. Perhaps it was this one. Hussein died in 1835, leaving his widow without a pension. Perhaps she and the Indian accountants uh, arranged something for her. But beside this mosque, built by Indians for Indians, in this modest little cemetery, is the grave of the last Sultan of Singapore. It says he was buried at this place with full honours due to a sultan. And so he should have been. And as the Temengong Abdul Rahman's son, Dane Ibrahim, asserted his power over Johor, the same son Ali still claimed that he was the Sultan of Singapore and Johor. However, Dane Ibrahim and his son Abu Bakr had become staunch allies of the British. So a deal was brokered and the British recognised that Sultan Ali's son was indeed the 19th Sultan of Johor but without sovereignty. Instead, he was given $500 a month pension plus $5,000 cash and sovereignty over this area, Khe Sang and Moi. Population 800. Sultan Ali entered into all manner of intrigues in order to get the support of the other sultans. As a consequence, he left the running of his estates in the hands of a rather dubious Bugist called Sully Watang. Sully Watang was an absolute disaster. His tax collectors and agents all managed to get themselves shot by associates of the Temengong of Moi. Because the Temengong of Moi thought that he was the real ruler of the place. And in 1877, Sultan Ali died, and he is buried here on the outskirts of Malacca. He left a couple of squabbling sons, one of which was Alam Shah, and Alam Shah was absolutely determined to fight for what he thought was rightfully his.
Here we are on the bridge across the river Kassan. On this side is Sultan Alam Shah's land, and on that side it's Johor. And in 1879, Sultan Alam Shah had himself proclaimed Sultan of Johor and Pahang. And then he and a few of his supporters crossed the river and took over the town of Jamanta, sparking the Jamanta Civil War. And this was a nasty little firefight that ended in Abu Bakr's favour. In fact, Abu Bakr had all the cards. He developed his land and made a fortune. He cultivated the Chinese. He had a small but British trained army. And best of all, he was best friends with Queen Victoria. And as is the case with many of these disputes, money exchanged hands. And Alam went into retirement, making Sultan Abu Bakr the undisputed Sultan of Johor. And for a moment, he thought he might make Wa his capital. And so he built these rather splendid colonial buildings here. And then, just like Paramisra, he thought better of it. There were too many ghosts of old Johor there. And so, here we have Johor Bahru, new Johor. There was magic and meaning and the excitement of honour and dishonour in the lives of the people of old Johor. There were celebrations and processions and the arts and crafts were elevated by demanding patrons. And here old Johor sleeps and dreams of warriors and peace, prosperity and sanity. And we're still negotiating that balance between mundane affluence and the dreams of a golden age.